ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the entry of the official party. Remain standing for the playing of the national anthem. United States Air Force. <laughs> Colonel Lawrence Havard, Commander of the Air Force ROTC Detachment 720. <laughs> Colonel Retired Nathan Allerheiligan, Previous Commander of Air Force ROTC Detachment 720. Retired Eugene McFeely, previous commander, Air Force ROTC Detachment 720. <laughs> Cadre, family, and friends, welcome to today's special event. Today is a very special day and a once in a lifetime event. Thank you for taking the time to support our commissioning cadets and for being with them today as they mark a significant milestone in their lives. On this day, we commission seven amazing cadets as second lieutenants in the United States Air Force. Commissioning is a significant moment in the lives of these airmen. This ceremony not only marks the culmination of their ROTC and college experience, it is the first step forward in their new lives as active duty military officers. All airmen take an oath upon entry into military service. Officers take the oath of office upon commissioning and renew that oath with each promotion. There are many different oaths, but all include a formal declaration or promise to fulfill a pledge. Following today's ceremony, these young men and women 
will immediately hold a higher rank than over 80% of the airmen in the United States Air Force. This authority, as derived in the oath, comes directly from the President of the United States. The Military Officer's Oath is a combination of constitutional requirement, historical influence, and centuries-old custom. To better appreciate the oath, one must have some understanding of its history. Military oaths date back to ancient Rome, where soldiers pledged loyalty to a specific general for a specific campaign. After the campaign ended, the oath no longer applied. By 100 BC, Rome had established a professional military, and the oath became effective for the soldier's full 20-year service. Since then, the custom has continued and expanded. The very first law of the United States of America, enacted in the first session of the first Congress on the 1st of June, 1789, was Statute 1, Chapter 1, an act to regulate the time and manner of administering certain oaths, which established the oath required by civil and military officials to support the Constitution. The Founding Fathers agreed upon the importance of ensuring that officials promised their allegiance to an ideal, not a person. Indeed, very little debate occurred before the First Congress passed the, this statute. Although the wording of the military officer's oath has changed several times in the past 200 years, the Foundation has withstood the test of time. In our oath, we pledge feel, feel fidelity to our American national ideals, promising to always perform to the best of our ability, be excellent in all we do, do so with integrity, and always putting military service before our self-interests. As ROTC cadets, our commissionees all took the oath of enlistment. This is not the first time they have raised the right hand to support and defend the Constitution. However, it is the first time that they will take this obligation to well and faithfully discharge the duties of their new office. The current oath is more than a mere formality that adds to the pageantry of commissioning or a promotion ceremony. It provides a foundation for our leadership decisions. It is, by all accounts, a moral compass. For the purpose of today, the act of affirming the oath of office should serve to guide these young officers as they embark on their careers in the United States Air Force. Wherever and whenever they find themselves in difficult situations, it will hopefully guide them and provide the foundation for a long, prosperous, and productive career. In the United States Air Force, the second lieutenant are identified by the gold bars that they wear on their uniforms. We will now begin pinning the ranks for each cadet. After the ranks are pinned on, cadets will remain on stage and the guests may return to their seats. You may take pictures. At this time, will Smita and Anat Bednar come to the stage to pin Cadet Bednar's ranks? Robert and Michelle Burns, please come to the stage to pin Cadet Burns' ranks.
Please come to the stage to pin Cadet Dindle's ranks. Will Denise and James Marshall please come to the stage to pin that Marshall's ranks? Rodney Spots, please come to the stage to pin Cadet Spots ranks. We will now be continuing with the oath of office. Brigadier General Kalen, Air Force Director of Civil Engineers, De Deputy Chief of Staff for Logistics, Engineering, and Force Protection, Headquarters U.S. Air Force, 
be the presiding official administering the oath of office for today's ceremony. Sir, the floor is yours. All right. Can you all hear me all right? Yes. yes. Okay. I don't even know if I need this, but I'll, I'll keep it here just in case uh, for the folks online. So, uh, I don't know, I have escaped from the Pentagon for the day, and uh, I really need to feel like I'm in Happy Valley, so if you help me out here. We are! Penn State! We are! Penn State! Thank you! You're welcome. All right. <laughs> so, uh, when I worked on the joint staff, they always said, you know, whenever you came and spoke, uh, be brief, be good, and be gone. And I promise you, I am leaving State College tomorrow, and I'm heading back. The other two, you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I know my uh, Penn State uh, professor for public speaking is probably uh, uh, freaking out right now. Uh, go all over the place here. So I'd first like to start out by uh, thanking the uh, Penn State administration here, uh, uh, Dr. Adams and, and uh, Mr. Clifford running the Alumni Association. Uh, thank you very much for supporting the program here. Um, I can't tell you how important it, it is to folks, and especially with a lot of the new things that you know what we have coming in. Your support is absolutely uh, vital for that. I can speak here from experience. I would not be standing here uh, today with the uh, stars on my shoulder if it wasn't for my experience at uh, Penn State. And uh, you can see I'm getting a little emotional about it, which is a little surprising to me here. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I came to Penn State a punk. Uh, <laughs> I came here, you know, not really knowing what was going on with the world, and I left with a passion. I left with a skill as an engineer, and I left as a leader because of what Air Force ROTC gave me, and I can't thank you enough, and I appreciate you doing that for all these cadets and, and, and other folks uh, in the room. Uh, next, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Colonel Havard for uh, bringing me back here. It's, it's uh, um, great to, to come back and, and talk to the cadets. Really humbled to do it at your alma mater. Thank you for that. I also would like to thank uh, uh, Colonel uh, A12. I'm going to say it that way. <laughs> Colonel McKeeley, uh, the previous uh, PASs. Uh, to the two of you, uh, uh, I can tell you from my experience, uh, Colonel Harvey Shelton is my PAS, and, and I know the two of you have both had a huge impact on cadets' lives, and it's it's significant. And I hope you realize that. Uh, next, folks, I kind of really want to. Uh, uh, highlight here are uh, parents and, uh, and the families and all the friends that are here you know, for these cadets. Uh, you know, they say that you know, we recruit airmen but we retain families and there's no more true statement uh, you know, than that. Uh, it's, it's really important what the families do and what they give and so uh, what I'd like to do is, is uh, these cadets or these lieutenants up here uh, owe the families a lot so I'm going to ask them all to stand up and let's give your parents and families a standing applause. Let's get loud. Come on. about the families and just you know another personal Penn State story for me uh, about family sacrifice so as you walk uh, in the Wagner building um, as you walk and you look to the right you see the freedom tree that tree is dedicated to Captain Charles Caffarelli the reason I'm really uh, uh, it means a lot to me is I was fraternity brothers uh, with uh, Craig and Brian Caffarelli his sons and they serve today still today his father was killed in action, actually still missing in action, you know, from Vietnam. And we ask a lot uh, from our families, and obviously that's the ultimate sacrifice. But there's going to be missed holidays, missed birthdays, uh, long periods of uh, time not seeing your loved ones, and I say thank you very much uh, for that. And then uh, finally here, get to the, uh, uh, the lieutenants here, and I'll, I'll kind of ramble on here a little bit. Um, first, just congratulations. If I could, I'd trade. Uh, my stars for your bars in a second. I know a lot of you'd be like, yeah, I'll trade you your <laughs> The job comes with it, along with the, uh, you know, the, uh, the desk in the Pentagon, and, and I'm going to give you three kids. 
Uh, yeah, I would trade spots with you. And, uh, it's just, it's a, uh, yeah, it's such a, a great opportunity to serve right now. And I kind of want to share, I'm going to share kind of three little stories here, uh, you know, with you and uh, kind of get some lessons. I'm just going to tell you, you know, what you need to do, but I think there's some stories that kind of uh, make some, uh, gives a little context to stuff. So, uh, Probably the best leadership lesson I ever received was not in a class at Penn State, uh, but it was right after I became a cadet wing commander. We would do our practices in the Huluba Hall, or our uh, parades in Huluba Hall where the football team would practice. And as I was walking out to my car, which was parked next to a, an old Buick with a Sabre, I see this old coach, uh, Joe Paterno, uh, walking out there. So this is 1994, and uh, we know we were going to be good in football that year. You know, Kerry Collins, Kajana Carter, Kyle O'Brady, you know, all those folks. And so I thought I'd, you know, I basically said, hey, coach, uh, you know, real excited about next year. You know, wish you good luck. And uh, I don't know if it's typical of Joe Paterno, but uh, Joe decided to turn that into a teaching moment. <laughs> and I kid you not, for the next 45 minutes, <laughs> he taught me. And uh, I'll give you the 45-second version, uh, but it went something like this. Luck, luck. What are you talking about luck? It's about hard work. And let me tell you about the hard work. The guys are gonna wake up early every day, they're gonna hit the weights. They're not just gonna hit the weights, they're gonna do better than what they did the day before. Then they're gonna go do breakfast. And it's not just a normal breakfast, it's a good, healthy breakfast. And then after breakfast, they're gonna go to class. They're not just gonna go to class, they're gonna do well in class. Because if they don't do well in class, they don't play in field. Uh, after class, they're gonna do practice. And they're not gonna just practice, they're gonna practice perfection. Uh, and they're going to keep doing it over and over and over until they get it right. And then they're going to go home and they're going to study uh, and ensure that, you know, they do or they can uh, keep going to class. And then, you know, maybe after three months of all this hard work, it'll be a cold November day, it'll be raining. Our guys are going to be out in the field. They're not going to be tired because they're prepared. They're going to know what they need to do. And then just maybe once, they're going to be the right place at the right time. And that ball is going to bounce in their hand. That, my son, is how you get luck. <laughs> so, wow, I've been telling that story for 25 years. Uh, so my thing to you all is, is uh, you know, the most important thing that you do in the Air Force is the hard work. Uh, you aren't going to get anything without hard work. Uh, second thing is practice perfection. I would rather sweat than bleed, and that's hugely important in the military. Practice perfection. And the last thing, especially uh, when you show up, we expect you to lead by example. That's not something you start doing and, you know, after some time there, but no, you need to uh, lead by example. Second story, I'm going to kind of fast forward. It's a couple months after 9-11, uh, you know, and Captain Kale was in a, a Red Horse squadron, a combat engineer squadron. I'm up in uh, uh, Montana. It's about, have about a foot of snow, it's zero degrees, and we're doing an air assault exercise, uh, you know, with the Army, and I get a a message that I'm going to take my uh, uh, air fuel evaluation team. On the other side of the, the globe is uh, eastern Afghanistan. It's a Friday afternoon, and i got to be there you know, by Monday or, or Tuesday. Literally get picked up, flown across the world. Uh, next thing I know, I'm on a, a couple of helicopters. My team's on one helicopter, and there's Army Special Forces on the other helicopter. We get down in the field, and, and uh, you know, the uh, paving eval folks, the civil engineers will know what a dynamic cone centrometer is. Uh, it's a uh, you know, device that tests oil. It's literally, you just lift like a 17 pound weight up, uh, about 17 inches, and you drop it and count how far it, it uh, goes into the ground. And so I'm doing this, and as I'm standing there, you know, um, I couldn't see him, but the Army uh, Special Forces lead is behind me, and it's like, wow. Uh, you would think someone from the Air Force would have something more high tech than this lead weight that's dropping uh, down. And, and the thing is, is while you're doing it, you have to pay attention and you have to, you know, really pay, uh, uh, make sure you're counting and, and not getting distracted. And I'm just sitting there like, man, this guy's annoying. And then <laughs> this next thing he says is, is, wow, you would think a Penn State engineer could do this better. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, what? How does he know I'm a Penn State? And I'm trying to count. And I finally finish, I write the number down, and I'm like, uh, I'm going to turn around and, uh, you know, see who this guy is. I get all of a sudden I get tackled, and I start hearing uh, uh, gunfire, and, and uh, 
you know, when I finally come to and I see who it is, it's actually one of my buddies who I did an uh, Army uh, Ranger Club here at, at, at Penn State. You're wondering what the heck, where am I going with this story? A uh, couple things for you here. Number one, day one, you got to be ready physically, mentally, financially. Uh, get your ducks in a row now. You never know when you're going to get called. I literally had uh, a few days and I'm on the other side of the world. Be ready. Uh, I cannot harp that enough. You know, the uh, second thing there is know your job and trust the others to know their job. You know, I was doing my job, focused, paying attention. My job enabled the Air Force to land C 130s in there the, uh, the next day so that we could bring hundreds and hundreds of uh, troops in to you know, deal with uh, operations in that area. You know, my friend's job was security, and he protected my life. And uh, you know, I, at the time, I didn't know it was him, but I sure as hell trusted uh, him for, for doing that. So know your job and trust the others to do their job. And the last piece, there's Penn Staters everywhere. <laughs> you can rely on them. If you need help, you can ask them. And even if they aren't from Penn State, you know, if you do need to ask for help, it's OK to ask for help. You know, a lot of folks have this misconception in the military that you can't ask for help. That is absolutely not true. Whether it's something for your job or it's something personally, do not be afraid to ask for help. And that kind of led, I'm going to finish up with my last story. This is probably a little bit, uh, well, it's kind of a sad story, and it's probably one that's a little controversial here. It deals with Joe Paterno again, and it, uh, um, you know, kind of fast forward to, you know, the time when we had the, the scandal was announced and, and, and Joe Pa, you know, lost his job. And uh, one of the things that he said really struck home to me you know, after he, uh, you know, wasn't a football coach anymore. And he talked about, you know, the scandal. And, uh, you know, what he said as a leader was, you know, this is horrible. I am so sorry about this. With the vision of hindsight, I wish I could have done more. And that is hugely powerful to hear something like that, you know, from a leader. And, and what I say to you is, is um, accountability matters. We care about accountability. And we don't necessarily care about, you know, whether that individual did or not. He was in charge. He was a leader. You know, he took ownership of that. And that's something that you need to, uh, you know, really kind of embrace that. And that's something we value uh, in the military. The second thing is, is own your mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. Hopefully not a lot of them, because you're going to practice perfection. But you're going to make mistakes. When you make those mistakes, own them. And then do everything in your power uh, to make sure that you can overcome uh, those challenges. And the last piece here, uh, you know, with respect to this, it's your job to protect and respect all the people in your organization. You own the culture of your organization. And there's no... Um, Trading that away, there's, you know, it, it has to be done right. And if something bad has happened, you need to take action, you need to fix it. I don't care if someone's smart or not so smart, they're black, they're white, they're old, they're young, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. It's your job to protect and respect the folks in our culture. So, uh, I definitely appreciate uh, having the opportunity uh, to speak here. Uh, I wish you all the best. As I said before, man, I would trade spots with you in a nanosecond. Uh, we're in a uh, great transition here uh, in our Air Force. You know, we used to be focused on uh, dealing with uh, non-state actors or the terrorists and, and having people uh, uh, ensure that you know we're we're uh, handling those types of issues. And now we're transitioning to more of a strategic competition dealing uh, more with Russia and China. And we need all of you uh, in the Air Force and the skill sets that you're bringing. Uh, this is uh, uh, it's definitely something uh, that we need to do a lot better, and we need to uh, accelerate change or lose, as our chief would say. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's just a great time to serve. So I'll finish up here, um, and you'll see if I'm a hypocrite here in this last statement according to what I said about uh, Joe Pa, but uh, definitely uh, work hard, have fun, and good luck, and don't suck. <laughs>
I'd ask that you stand. And uh, for the folks here, um, you know, this oath is uh, basically sealing their commitment to serve in the Air Force. And they hope we use this oath, you look back onto it, to uh, inspire integrity, uh, service before self, and excellence in all you do. Next, I would like to call Barry Metz. 
officer, forward to, for the first salute of Second Lieutenant Carolyn Spots. So, Betty, you probably thought uh, this was a wise idea, right? <laughs> they, they may question your decision making uh, when you interact with duty. In, in all seriousness, what I want to talk about with uh, Anita is that he resembles everything that I wish I had been when I commissioned on 13 May 1990. And what I mean by that is I have wish I had had that level of commitment at that age. I wish I had had that level of compassion at that age. And more importantly, I wish I had had that level of attentiveness to detail and taking care of others. Because my first eight years may have resembled more of General Gale's first eight years. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, he, he is going to make a superior officer if he continues on the path of growth that I've witnessed over the last 18 months. Six of it, him taking the easy way out uh, as a Zoom cadet, um, last 12, uh, firmly in person, and more importantly, survived six months working with me as a, the cadet wing commander last spring, uh, where I saw his confidence soar. And I stand before you with a zero reservation that you are going to make an outstanding leader, and you'll also be an okay cyber. <laughs> the point I want to make is what I relish about the Marine Corps is they are a Marine first and then something else. And we need to imbibe more of that culture when it comes to, as officers, leaders first and then what they pay us to do from a functional perspective. Always keep that mindset, Kenita, and you're going to be well served and very successful. Congratulations. Sustainability 
by reducing water pollution in the area and learning to salsa dance. <laughs> I can say with utter confidence that she'll take that same passion and employ it as a developmental engineer in the United States Air Force. She's following a proud tradition of family service. Watching dad as a Coast Guardsman inspired her to join Air Force ROTC. And hopefully, after today, we can change her proudest ROTC memory from celebrating when she returned home after successfully completing field training to celebrating after earning her commission. Congrats, LT. You're going to do great things in Big Blue, and I hope our paths cross again one day. Lieutenant Williams, will you please come to the stage to speak on behalf of Second Lieutenant Dindle? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Second Lieutenant Mike Williams. I graduated in May. Um, all these fine young ladies and gentlemen were in my class. Um, came back to see uh, all of them commissioned. I'm so happy to be here. Um, today, I'm speaking on behalf of my dear friend Carson Dindle. As most of us know him as Din Dad. <laughs> I met Carson uh, freshman year when we both lived in Brumbaugh. He was the dreaded ninth floor and I was the superior tenth floor. Um, first semester, I only knew him as a kid from Florida. Uh, and he was in Army J. Rotsy in high school. I had to bring that one up, sorry. <laughs> in the spring, uh, Carson showed up for our first training session uh, at Honor Guard. And Started out with a great introduction by calling the honor guard commander by the wrong name. So that was a, a great time. And then he proceeded to march with Army Cadence, which made our first training day go so well. Um, but after that, we improved and got better. And throughout the whole semester, we really bonded um, as a group. And I really got to know Carson a lot better. Um, from that point on, uh, it was a difficult semester, but we got through it, and we got into the Honor Guard, and it was awesome. Um, and we all loved our experiences in the Honor Guard together, working together. Carson was always a very genuine leader and person, and that really impressed me. Uh, he worked very hard in school, in civil engineering, as well as in ROTC. Carson worked with a lot of underclassmen I saw throughout his time as a junior and senior, working with them to make sure they did their engineering work and studied well, and that really impressed me with how much devotion he gave to them. Um, I was impressed. As well, he showed a lot of leadership in Honor Guard and put in a lot of effort to make sure we kept our organization running and doing the things we needed to do for our community. I'm glad I was able to come today. Penn State is home for me, and even though State College is amazing, it wasn't the town. It was the people that really made it home. And Carson was one of those people that made it home for me. These fine ladies and gentlemen commissioning today, especially Carson, played a huge part in my experience here, and I really thank them for that. Carson is going to carry so many good things into his job as an aircraft maintenance officer. I know one day all of his airmen, on one day, on day one, excuse me, <laughs> day one, all of his airmen will be in good hands. Congratulations, Carson. Lieutenant Williams, I had hair like that once. <laughs> that was a long, 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 long time ago. Uh, <laughs> Colonel Havard and uh, General Kale, thanks for letting me uh, come up here and say a few words today. Uh, Gene, it's good to see you. Uh, Jeff, send my best to everybody in the UE staff, and it's uh, good to have everyone here, Paul. It's great to see the alumni here. So when the general's talking about Penn Staters everywhere, as I understand it, Penn State has the largest alumni association of any American university. So that's an incredible network. As you guys eventually go off into the real world, uh, you're bound to bump into Penn Staters of all sorts of uniforms and without uniforms there as well. So enjoy that experience. A um, couple of shout outs. Grace has got a fair number of people. Now, do we have 
Online? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> all right. Oh, well, that's because that one. I couldn't tell. All right, cool. It's like, hey. All right. So, uh, Robin, Kevin, it's great to have you guys here. Is Caitlin here? Caitlin? In flight. Hopefully they got good Wi-Fi service. Okay, good. Reed, it's good to see you there. Uh, too bad you couldn't go after her. This you can even her the first loose a little bit. That's okay. Maggie got it covered. It's good to see you again, Maggie. That's great. And Haley as well. Uh, and we got Natalie Stevens. The big fans and big supporters are out there. Did they make it? A few of them in there. Okay, that's good. Wizard Squadron is probably online somewhere. Everybody else who didn't make it there. Oh, over here, I'm hearing the shouts. Okay, that's great. Uh, and Foster, Bauer, and Madeira, the beans. Shout out to everyone there online and in person, that's great. Um, as a father of six, uh, and a former college professor, so to speak, I recognize how rare it is to meet someone with laser focus at 18 years. Most college students will go through multiple changes of their majors before they get across the finish line. Uh, Grace is rare, Breed. From day one, I met her. She says, I'm going to study meteorology. I'm going to become an Air Force weather officer. Uh, for those of us who slip the surly bonds from time to time, we rely heavily on those wizards who can compile an immense amount of data through fluid dynamics and computer models to give us accurate predictions of the hazards we may face halfway around the world. That's absolutely amazing. Uh, although I did try several times to bring her to the dark side and be a pilot. It didn't work. Darn it. Oh well, she has always remained true to her path to be a weather officer in the United States Air Force. That is fantastic. I think a lot of that focus and inspiration comes from her family. Uh, both of her grandfathers. Do you think? Yes, sir. <laughs> right, cool. No? Too bad. All right, okay. Yeah, that's all right. Both of her grandfathers, dad served uh, as well in the first Gulf War. Brother right here sitting in uniform as a member of the Massachusetts National Guard. Yes. Uh, thank you for your service. Thanks to the grandparents as well who inspired her along the way. Uh, that is ex great. Uh, your example of dedication, devotion, and integrity have made a deep impact on this great young leader here before us. Um, in addition to her focus, I've always noted her optimism, her sunny. Okay, that was a weather joke. <laughs> this position uh, brings light uh, on the team that cues them in, performing the task at hand with precision and excellence. One of her most challenging tasks was to perform a ceremony for the Preservers of War Missing in Action. It's an annual ceremony, it usually happens in September. We've got front office members of the university who come there. It is a joint ROTC event, so the entire, all three branches are there and present. And there's just an inordinate amount of details that have to be taken care of. Uh, Grace got tossed into that fire early, nailed it. It was absolutely fantastic. And from that point forward, there was no doubt that she was gonna continue on and do some absolutely amazing things. Uh, she was elected as the squadron commander for the Arnold Air Society as an underclassman, which showed how the rest of the society looked upon her for her leadership to instill some discipline. She owned the culture and made it a fantastic organization uh, above what it had already been before. And then she worked closely with a couple other teammates uh, to pull out an absolutely outstanding four-star regional conference as part of the uh, regional conclave for that same Arnold Air Society. Many of her favorite ROTC memories include from that Arnold Air Society affiliation. So whether working community events, hosting regional conferences, or 46 hours of dancing for Thon online. <laughs> But you know, you nailed it there, and, and has built family connections beyond just the student body, but within the community, and, and how uh, organizations like Arnold Air Society develop relationships with the Thon families that last for years to come, and that has been really, really great. She has uh, worked with Phoenix Flight of the Arnold Air Society, demonstrating excellence, always being at the front.
Other fond memories include some base visits and Skittles Gate. No, wait, no, Skittles Gate was something else, but. Uh, <laughs> Something about two hours and too many Skittles in the snow, but that's okay. Uh, her interest in multiple segments of the Air Force that she learned from those base visits will serve you well as a weather officer because you will find that it's not just those uh, pointy-nosed, zipper-zooted sun gods that want to know the weather. There's a lot of other folks, perhaps the civil engineers of the world, you know, it's like, I need to drop this weight. <laughs> And I don't want it to go all the way through because it's wet, you know, that kind of thing. So it's great. Uh, Lieutenant Kimsey's initiatives was well demonstrated when she started a tech team for the cadet wing. Many of her team's efforts were in place at just the right time when COVID-19 changed the way we did business across the entirety of the university, not just within Air Force ROTC. Her long record of cadet accomplishments is too many for me to fully detail, but you can appreciate her prowess when I mentioned that she culminated her cadet career as the vice wing commander working next to Lieutenant Bender. Is that right? Last spring? Fall. All fall and spring. Okay. That was nice. All right, good. I need to I need to take better notes. Okay. <laughs> In addition to ROTC, she also served as the president of the Marine Society her senior year. She traveled to Iceland, Australia, Belize, shucks, to study sustainability and was accepted into the Meteorology Honor Society, Chi Epsilon Pi. In addition to her degree, she is also earning a minor in military studies and will graduate as a laureate from the College of Earth and Mineral Science Academy. By the way, graduating with a meteorology degree is no small task. And I'll say this kind of across all these folks here. They're, if you look at their degrees from the bios, these are not simple projects that they're going through. Mathematics, engineering degrees, meteorology. And, and, and it's very, very common across the university for students that don't have the level of commitment that they do to take five years to do these degrees. And you notice that they're all knocking them out in four and a half. That is just a fantastic, uh, testimony to their academic prowess and their focus to be able to handle the rigors of an ROTC leadership program and very challenging academics and get it all done in four and a half years. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, one last ad hoc story that I'm going to just kind of throw in there is um, Cadet Kimsey at the time did learn a story of readiness. Uh, it was late one evening, she was out amongst the town working with some friends, sitting down at a place called Zena's, and an old bald guy walks up to her and slaps a coin on the table. And she is absolutely dumbfounded to find her old PAS standing there in front of her, wondering, where is your round metal object? Anyway. Uh, Good fortune did shine upon her, so even though she was not prepared at the time, I still bought the drinks, so it was all good. <laughs> As with all weather officers, her first Air Force home will be amongst the riverboats in Biloxi, Mississippi at uh, Keesler Air Force Base. Uh, while she awaits her opportunity to activate, she will continue a marketing internship, hang with her dogs, and do a little bit of more travel. Although it's hard to be Australian police to start out with, so it's, that's all great. Grace, you are a great leader, and you're going to do some great things in the time ahead. Well done. And rather fortunate, there's a coin right there waiting for you, so it's going to be good to go. All right. Now I get to stand in place and get our next guest here for the day. Uh, Garrett McKay, who I think gets the award for both the, both the most number of guests here. Everyone in Garrett's crowd, stand up and yell. Okay. Uh, did anybody actually come in from Ireland or Germany? Yes. All right, fantastic. And then, so I think they also get the guest uh, for the farthest travel to come to the ceremony. Well done, that's pretty fantastic. Um, it was almost like, you know, a wedding is like, okay, we got uh, guests of the bride and guests for McKay. <laughs> All over there. Uh, every student has a story. Garrett's got a couple of them. 
Uh, they come from different places, different families, experiences, carve their own path through their time in the university and with ROTC. Garrett has asked me to share a couple of his stories. Remember, the Air Force standard is only has to be 10% true for it to be said in public. <laughs> so we're going to highlight a f some of his paths to this uh, momentous occasion. Uh, I have <laughs> I had the pleasure of watching Garrett transform throughout his college career. It's a great honor to share this moment with you now. My goal is to get him as red as the stripes on the field. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I met you at your new cadet orientation, as I did for most of these folks. Uh, interesting stuff, except for Jim Levery, uh, very few of the folks that we actually interview for scholarships actually come from the local area. They usually the poor folks up in Wilkes-Barre and St. Joe's send us all their top candidates to come to school here. So, uh, you know, on a hot, steamy August afternoon, all these fresh faces come in. I rub elbows with mom and dad and say, trust me, we're going to take care of them. It's going to be okay. Uh, and, and then we put the kids somewhere else. And as soon as the parents are down the road in the Ag Sci building, then the fun begins. But anyway, I got a chance to, to meet Garrett. And, and you'll notice his personality is just open. Uh, he's very enthusiastic, always very humble, uh, and he said right from the get-go he wanted to become a pilot, so I knew I liked him, <laughs> which is okay. Although he did wear glasses, now we've changed places, I'm the one with the shades, and you're, you're sitting there with a nice big bright smile, so it's okay. Uh, well, Gary, it does look like you've met those goals of serving your country. You get to go do that aviation thing. Maybe you can grow your hair long like Wilson, yeah, or Williamson, it'll be all good, yeah? You look like Sebastian Corda. You can look him up. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, all this I can say is for the folks from Germany, I just had a holiday there. Fantastique. All right, so, marketing from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Garrett was charged through, his, or charged through his degree in the ROTC program. Along the way, he learned a lot about circuits, programming, and Russian linguistics. Yeah, much to our surprise, I get a phone call, or I talked to Mrs. Newman, the secretary, and she said, Cadet Garrett McKay is sick. I'm like, okay. Um, is any at home? He's in Poland. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. He was on an international language immersion program to the Baltic states, Lithuania. Yes? Latvia. Latvia. They're right next to each other. Uh, <laughs> somehow ended up in Poland with an acute appendicitis. And oh. I'm like, goodness. And the story that I then hear on the back, which I think will live in infamy forever, was nobody in the hospital spoke English. But the only way he could talk to anybody to manage his care, Mom, you okay? Have you recovered from this? Okay. Uh, was in Russian. His doctor spoke Russian. And, and so he would have conversations at night about what was going on in Russian. Talk about a crash course in the immersion program right there. Uh, <laughs> So uh, it looks like it's all been good. I would say dasvidaniya, but I don't think that's the right word for right now, but we'll, we'll work with that, right? <laughs> yeah, that's amazing that you got uh, back from that in one piece. <laughs> <laughs> it, maybe 80 grams lighter, but otherwise, okay. Uh, Kinect McKay, or then Kinect McKay, joined ROTC with the goal of becoming more confident. Losing his father as a teenager, he gravitated to military service as a means to mature and grow with discipline and organizational skills. He also sought a means to help pay for school and alleviate that burden from his mom. That's a very honorable action indeed. Uh, while at school, he excelled both in the classroom and in the field. His gentle spirit, tenacity, and perpetual goodwill made him a leader in the cadet wing and an innovator in the field. He tackled some tough projects while also handing some ext uh, his extremely demanding double major. As a leader of the tech team, he helped us procure and install some needed upgrades for the ROTC classroom. So now you can have a dance party with that speaker bar. <laughs> and he helped uh, head up some major renovations for the Debt 720 website. Uh, he cherishes his time with his friends. You know, they become the family away from home as you're going through that. Uh, spending a lot of time doing what college kids do, watching football, eating lots of good food, and binging scary movies. So those friends will become your family away from home. Yeah, I know you hold them close in the future. Penn State is renowned for its rigor and its engineering program. It's part of what makes Penn State such a strong engineering school. 
uh, of the various programs offered computer, engin computer engineering is perhaps one of the most difficult, combined with aspects of electrical engineering and computer science. Debugging. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, most students take the five years, but as I mentioned, for just the computer engineering part, Garrett's done it in four and a half and added a Russian major, not minor, Russian major on top of that. Uh, that's a task very few will accomplish and, and uh, well done on all that. Hopefully soon, Lieutenant McKay will be joining more of his friends and classmates at the proverbial Penn State South, also known as Columbus Air Force Base, Yeah, all, uh, to attend pilot training. Um, maybe you and Kim Z can you know, meet at the riverboats on the weekends, who knows, you know. They'll be in the neighborhood, you have a place to go. While awaiting his orders, he'll be working at the Tokihana Army Depot near Scranton, Pennsylvania, be using his computer engineering skills to perform independent verification and validation. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but testing software updates that are pushed to satellite communication systems used by the Army. So you're actually going to get a little bit of that Guardian space dust on you. So that's, that's pretty righteous right there. That's pretty cool. Garrett, you are a great man. The great future ahead. I'm proud of you. Well done. <laughs> families, I am so honored and so blessed to be here today for my son. He is an incredible young man, and he has always been an incredible young man. As a young child, his mom remembers, and I remember, sitting around watching Jimmy Neutron, <laughs> <laughs> watching the Big Bang Theory, and he used to joke and say, hey, do you want to grow up and be a rocket scientist, when I grew up and be a, you know, go to space, and he said he always wanted to help people get to space, to help others do what they need to do. He's gonna have, he's a degree, and he's an astronautical development engineer. And aerospace is not an easy degree, just like was mentioned, numerous other degrees here. And he's traveled through this He's moved through this, and he's done a fantastic job. Now, we spoke about oath. We, we spoke about family earlier. We, we spoke about how you always do your best. A number of years ago, I wasn't doing my best. This young man came to me one day and said, Dad, you always ask me, do my best in school, and running, and everything I do, and scouts, everything I do. I don't see that from you. And he turned around and walked away. Well, guess what? That put a spark in me. And from that point on, I take that spark, and thanks to this young man, I've done that. I'm a better person today because of Ryan Marshall. People say to me now, are you Ryan Marshall's dad? I said, of course I am. Yes. He's an incredible young man. He's done everything he can to help his family out, help his friends out. As a young man, he was in scouts. And in scouts, he worked his way up through and he found a way to talk to the older scouts. You know, as kids. Kids usually hang out with the kids their own ages. He was talking to the older scouts. He was hanging out with them, learning from them. He went to three or four Eagle Scout ceremonies that they have in Hershey, Pennsylvania every year for the, the big things for the, the council and saw his friends become Eagle Scouts and said, he's gonna be an Eagle Scout one day. He did that. He moved forward. He made a plan. He moved forward with that. He did that. I drove by the park the other day in Enola, Pennsylvania, 
down in Turkey Park where he did his Eagle Project and the signs of his Eagle Project signs for the trees are still up there. And I've talked to people in the area who still live in that area. They say, that was our boy that did those trees, that tree project there. We used that in our school program last year. So it's being used in the community. He's paying it forward. He's doing those things that help out, not just himself, not just the people right now, but people in the future. Ryan, again, is an incredible, incredible man. He's got a busy life in front of him right now. He has a, an incredible new family he's starting. His fiance is here today as well. And he is going to be moving forward with his degree, with his job, having a job placement down in Maryland in a couple of weeks, he'll be down there. And then waiting for his deployment where he'll be going and whatever the military asks him to do, whatever anybody asks him to do, he's gonna be in front of it. He's the one that they don't have to ask for volunteers because Ryan is always sta already standing there waiting to be told what to do. And I know you guys have seen him. Thank you, Ryan, for all you have done, for yourself, for your family, and thank you for all you'll be doing in the future for the Air Force. Thank you. Please come to the stage to speak on behalf of Second Lieutenant Spots. <clears throat> I've known Carolyn literally since the day she was born. Watching her grow throughout the ensuing years has been filled with wonder. As a teacher, my philosophy has always been that a student will always meet your expectations. So if your expectations are low, then they will meet them. If your expectations are high, on the other hand, and you expect behavior that excels, you'll get that as well. Carolyn's parents were also of that mindset. And as Carolyn grew, it's been a joy to see her set goals and mature into the lovely young woman you see today. Though a joyful journey, it was sometimes a bit messy, as when she was learning to eat by herself <laughs> and got more of the SpaghettiOs all over her body instead of her mouth, and we won't even talk about the floor or a bit tough, as when she was learning to run and climb and took quite a few tumbles. Or unnerving, as when she wanted to pet every animal in sight and some weren't quite as amenable as others. Or challenging, as when learning to ski and she had a few yard cells on the mountainside. We had to gather equipment from hither and yon or tasty as when her, she and her dad had culinary adventures in the kitchen, or, mm, I'm not sure of the verb here, um, she built a solar oven and cooked hot dogs at the mountains. <laughs> not good. <laughs> or heartwarming as when we enjoyed baking Christmas cookies together. As she grew older, she set her own expectations of herself, always curious and adventurous. She questioned everything and the goal setting for herself reached new heights. Our adventures to Hershey Park every summer began to get more challenging as she only wanted to ride roller coasters from the time the park opened until the park closed. Our record is 17. She tried out for high school field hockey team's goalie with the full intention of becoming the main goalie quickly 
and she succeeded in becoming the varsity goalie in her freshman year. She set high standards for herself in school as well, with the goal of attending a very high quality university. Her standards were high in other extracurricular activities as well, such as TSA, it's Technical, Technology Student Association, not the <coughs> TSA you all know. Okay, <laughs> where she began winning awards and she designed the winning t-shirt everyone wore in the state of Pennsylvania in her junior year. High school graduation for Carolyn wasn't a culmination, it was a true commencement, a beginning of the next step and new goals. Her goals in college became even higher with not only her selection of a quality university in Penn State, but the choice of a difficult major in mechanical engineering and her decision to join the Air Force ROTC program. It was a huge commitment of time and energy to an already heavy schedule, but her ultimate goals soon became very clear to all the adults in her life. She wanted to fly. When most of us speak of children who want to try their wings, we are using it in, as a figure of speech. Not so with Carolyn, she literally wanted to fly. She was ecstatic to reach that goal and garner a pilot slot upon commissioning. So as we watched her journey on gold, I have to say Carolyn is fearless. Okay, she's always been a risk taker. She presses the boundaries and has pushed past her comfort zone to achieve a goal she set for herself. But although she takes risks, she's never reckless. They're always well thought out, and she will pragmatically break each problem into portions that need to be addressed and then do them in a very rational, sensible, orderly fashion. She faces each problem relentlessly for the attitude that she'll conquer it. And because she's able to set goals and achieve them in an orderly fashion, it has earned her the respect from her fellow students. And because she approached everything with this mindset, she's always been seen as a leader by her peers from high school on, actually from kindergarten on. <laughs> These qualities are the qualities I think will set her apart as she makes her career choice as an Air Force pilot. to all of our speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now be continuing with the awarding of the Airman's Coin. Each of our new second lieutenants will shortly be awarded an Airman's Coin. The coin is a challenge coin that is awarded to Air Force Airmen on completion of officer training school or ROTC. It is used to welcome second lieutenants into the United States Air Force and give them a link to the heritage of the Air Force. So the first challenge coin awarded to airmen is symbolic for their transition from trainee to airmen. Origins of the coin can be traced back to the Army Air Corps, the predecessor of the Air Force. And that's why Lieutenant Kimsey was unprepared, Colonel A. She hadn't got her coin yet. <laughs> As legend goes, amidst World War I, a lieutenant ordered a small, solid bronze medallion, which he then presented to the other pilots in his squadron as mementos of their service together. The, gold, the coin was gold-plated, bore the squadron's insignia, and was quite valuable. One of the pilots in the squadron had never owned anything like this coin, placed it in a leather pouch, which he wore around his neck for safekeeping. A short while later, this pilot's aircraft was heavily damaged by ground fire, forcing him to land behind enemy lines, resulting in capture by the Germans. The Germans confiscated his personal belongings from his pockets, but they didn't catch the leather pouch around his neck. On his way to a permanent prisoner war facility, he was kept overnight in a small German-held French village near the front lines. During the night, the town was bombarded by the British, creating enough confusion to allow the pilot to escape. The pilot 
avoided German patrols by donning civilian attire, but all of his identification had been confiscated, so he had no way to prove his identity. With great difficulty, he crept across no man's land and contacted a French patrol. Unfortunately for him, the French had been on the lookout for German saboteurs dressed in civilian clothing. The French mistook the American pilot as a German saboteur and immediately prepared to execute. Desperate to prove his allegiance, without any identification, the pilot pulled out the coin from his leather pouch and showed it to his French captors. One of the Frenchmen recognized the unit insignia from the coin and delayed the execution long enough to confirm the pilot's identity. Once the pilot safely returned to his squadron, it became tradition for all members to always carry their coin, and a tradition was born. Today, challenged coins are awarded for outstanding service or identifying membership in a particular organization. All members of the unit are expected to always carry their coins. At any time, one member can challenge another to produce their coin. The challenged person cannot produce the coin, Drinks for the night are on them. <laughs> However, if the person wrongfully challenges um, and everyone else can produce their coins, drinks for the night are on the challenger. At this time, Colonel Havard will present Airman's coins. Lieutenants, please stand to receive your coin. Second Lieutenant Carolyn Spots. Second Lieutenant Ryan Marshall. Second Lieutenant Garrett McKay. Second Lieutenant Grace Kimsey. Second Lieutenant Carson Dindle. Second Lieutenant Angela Barnes. And Second Lieutenant Anita Bidner. first and foremost, uh, you know, Joe Kale said it best, we recruit individuals, but we retain families. And it's because of you and how you've raised and influenced these seven members sitting before you at present. We are the beneficiaries of that, and our job will be to prove that we want to retain the whole family. So, Joe Kale, thank you so much for coming. I know it's returning home for you. And you got to escape the Pentagon, so it probably wasn't a big ask on my part, but I know schedule-wise, you, you had to probably clear some things. Uh, my cadets, my cadet Wayne, we are eternally grateful that you were able to join us today. Dr. Adams, thank you for uh, being here to watch what we all aspire to produce uh, from both the academic realm as well as the ROTC realm, is those stewards that will go out in society and represent this institution and represent Blue fashion that we like to hold them. And it's especially a pleasure to have the Alumni Association there. I, I come from an institution that does have a, a strong Alumni Association, and, and I often joke that if Osama Bin Laden had been a BMI graduate, we wouldn't have spent 10 years looking for him, because I haven't changed my address in 30 years, and within six weeks of me moving, BMI knows how to find me. So uh, prepare for that. That might be why he's here. But, uh, in all seriousness, I will say uh, coming back and being part of the ROTC program is something I aspired to do for 29 years. And in the 18 months that I got to work with this program, and more importantly, cadets, now lieutenants, like the seven before you today, is what keeps me getting up every day. Uh, more importantly, the goal of any leader is to be able to fade away and that that unit will be able to accomplish its job at an even greater level than
than when you were president. And I know these seven are going to be the types of officers that when they interact to duty in their own places are going to be leaders that leave a unit better than it was when they arrived. So I will say, don't forget where you came from. I am always on retainer, by email, by phone, whatever you need, whenever you need it, regardless of where it is. And I know uh, the folks sitting down here at the far right that sat in my chair before me feel the same way about it, is we are happy to see you reach this point, and we will forever be in your corner to support you. And I wish you nothing but clear skies and all the thrust that you can have in a career that hopefully is, is as enjoyable as mine. So congratulations, relish the day. We have achieved great milestones, but it is just the beginning of a very bright future. Well done. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the reading of the Presidential Order of Commissioning. Captain Strome, please come to the podium to read said order. To all who shall, shall see these presents, greetings. Know ye that proposing special trust and confidence in the patriotism, valor, fidelity, and abilities of these men and women, I do appoint them as second lieutenants in the United States Air Force Reserve to serve as such from the 17th day of December, 2021. These officers will therefore carefully and diligently discharge the duties of the office to which appointed by doing and performing all manner of things thereunto belonging. And I do strictly charge and require those officers and other personnel of lesser rank to render such obedience as is due an officer of this grade and position. And these officers are to observe and follow such orders and directives from time to time as may be given by the President of the United States of America or other superior officers acting in accordance with the laws of the United States of America. This commission is to continue in force during the pleasure of the President of the United States of America under the provisions of those public laws relating to the officers of the armed forces of the United States of America and the component thereof in which this appointment is made. Done at the city of Washington this 17th of December in the year of our Lord 2021 and of the independence of the United States of America the 241st by the President signed Brian Kelly, Lieutenant General, DCS, Manpower, Personnel and Services and the Honorable Frank Kendall, Secretary of the United States Air Force. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give our new second lieutenants one more round of applause. You may all be seated. Would all the newly commissioned officers please come forward for a group photo in front of the flags. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, would you please rise for the playing of the Air Force song and the departure of the official party.
Thank you. This concludes our ceremony. Please come forward to join Attachment 720 in congratulating the newest second lieutenant in the United States Air Force. Feel free to take pictures here or elsewhere on the Penn State grounds to commensurate this, commensurate this special event. Thank you for your attendance and enjoy the rest of your day.